Okay. So I, uh, my last name is Eccles. I don't know if you have heard of that. You own the stadium. Yeah. <laughs> That is my family, and uh, my great-great-grandfather is uh, the original Eccles that came from Scotland to Utah and uh, started. Uh, we, we have not been hugely procreative, so the, the family is not that large, but it does have an impact. <laughs> I uh, grew up in Utah, mostly. And uh, from very young, I was pursuing uh, to be a good Mormon. Uh, from very young, I remember wanting to know God. Uh, in our family home evenings, when I was five years old, I remember sitting around and uh, sitting on the ground, kneeling with my family, praying at the end of family home evening, which is what Mormons do uh, weekly. And basically, wanting, seeing, kind of visualizing that God was in the back of the room, kind of a light, a presence over us. And my pursuits in the religious sphere of life was always to please God and know God. As I grew up, I was planning to go to BYU. Both my parents went to BYU. My father was one of the quarterbacks at the BYU football team <laughs> many years ago. And that was where I was headed. Uh, my father was a scholar, very honest with his studies, and he instilled that in me. He wanted me to go into business. I didn't. I wanted to go into science. I really wanted to know what is true and right about the world, and that was my pursuit. I was also, he, he was a historian of sorts, and he was extremely insistent that you pursue history honestly. And as I uh, grew up in very Mormon communities, Kaysville, Utah, uh, I started to discover, and my father was willing to let this pursuit uh, advance, that Perhaps the Book of Mormon itself, as well as the history for Joseph Smith, was not as uh, rosy as what had, was being taught to me. And I wanted to pursue truth honestly. And by the end of high school, I had decided that uh, there was not a real basis for trusting the, the Book of Mormon as a book of history. And uh, there were reasons to think that perhaps the prophets of the Mormon church were not uh, teaching things that I thought were appropriate, uh, polygamy be one of them and other, other things in the Mormon history. So by the end of high school, I left the Mormon church. I pursued paganism pretty hard for a short time, but I still pursued God uh, through, this is like in the 70s. Uh, I was pursuing God through various means and looking at <laughs> God created everything <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> You've read the book, haven't you? <laughs> so, uh, but I became aware of some Christians around me uh, that, that the story of Christianity was different. And the interpretations of the Bible that uh, I had been learning in Mormonism were not exactly what Christianity would be teaching me. I had, I had kind of tossed out the Book of Mormon and the Bible as just, this is not something to pursue. I wanted to pursue mathematics and science because it seemed more reliable. But all of a sudden, uh, on campus at Utah State, actually, uh, a Christian I was having a discussion with him. I was looking forward to a good argument, which was the only reason I really wanted to talk with him. Uh, and he, he was reading out of John and saying that Jesus was basically saying, I and the Father, or the Father, the Heavenly Father, or the One God Father, are one. And that Jesus was making a, a rather astounding claim that he was God on earth. He, he was one in essence with the Father. 
And I pulled out what Mormons often do, is that you cannot trust the Bible because it, you know, it, it, you can only trust it so far as it is translated correctly, and we don't know how it's translated. Well, he reached down into his backpack and pulled out a Greek New Testament that was basically a compilation of the manuscripts that you've been talking about. And he turned to that verse, and he started reading that verse and interpreting it for me there. And I was a mathematician. I knew the Greek letters and what, they were sound, what their sounds were, so I knew he was reading Greek. And I also recognized the Greek word for father, which uh, paternal comes from that particular Greek word. So all of a sudden, here was a guy translating that verse for me from the Greek. And it stunned me. I, I didn't know what to do with this. I had to, I de basically decided within a very short time that I had to reconsider the Bible as uh, something to investigate. Was it good history? Was it reliable? And then, do I really believe what Jesus is saying to me? That he and God in heaven are one essence. And it took me a lot of questions with him that he had to answer for me. But over the course of a, a couple years, he was, he was really getting tired of my delays. <laughs> but I have, you know, I, I wanted to be an honest investigator and he had to answer questions for me. And eventually I did turn my life over to Christ because of the historicity. He had given me books on archeology span and manuscript studies and I also fell in love with the person of Jesus Christ. The presentation of his life in the Gospels is, was stunning to me. And I again heard the call of that light, that presence that listens to our prayers. And the call to be good in the world, but also the offer of forgiveness through Jesus Christ. It just was so beautiful that I became a Christian. As a scientist, I, there are a lot of things to struggle with, not necessarily with the Bible. I, I'm very uh, comfortable with the Bible. Very, I've read it through many different translations, actually. And, but I do struggle sometimes with uh, the way we interpret some portions of Scripture as Christians. As a scientist, I have to make my science and my pursuit of God merge. In, in some sense, there's a long history of Christians doing this. In fact, science in the Western world is, is where it comes out of the universities, the Christian universities, where they say creation is also God's expression to us. Creation is telling us about itself, and it is truth as well as the things that are not scientific. God has presented to us a revelation of who he is, and those truths are wonderful and perfect and should collaborate. There should be no disagreement. So as a scientist, I have long worked to, to merge those two in ways that I can understand. I don't perfectly do it, but uh, it's always a, an, uh, a wonderful thing to recognize that God is speaking through creation and that God is speaking through the Bible. And I just have to be open and hearing and with a soft heart. So that's basically my story. Thank you. Uh, that's fantastic. Corey, I, I want to, there's some follow-up questions I want to ask, but I want to hear your story. And I want you to, before you share kind of your story, um, if you could just, since you were one of the, the editors of it, I, I also wanted to ask, why, why write the book? first. So why write the book and why write this particular book for PhDs coming in in their, in their movement into evangelical Christianity and share your story with us? To get something published, it has to be original and there's never been a book like this. <laughs> That's how I say it at the beginning and, and it's true. I thought about this some time back. Um, there are various um, communities uh, that have addressed the evangelical and Mormon questions in the conversation. And I felt like this was uh, a niche area that had never been addressed. Uh, there have been people that have been ex-Mormon that turned Christian. Uh, 
uh, didn't go into academics, maybe people did leave Mormonism, went into academics, went into atheism, uh, never were Mormon, uh, are pursuant of Jesus and are in academics. But no book has ever been written with those three things, that you're a former insider, current broadly evangelical Christian pursuing Jesus, and uh, you um, have an appreciation for the academic life of the mind, and you're pursuing it in the universities. And so there's a conversation piece that I wanted to um, gather a group of people who satisfied those criteria and uh, be able to start the conversation in a new way. Uh, and so tomorrow night, you know, Vince is moderating a discussion. Uh, I'll be one of the participants with a, a Mormon scholar and a Muslim scholar. And we're hoping to engage on a, on a you know, good conversational terms with BYU faculty and things like that. Uh, so we come at it from a little bit different angle, I think. Um, we've all got our stories, but we have our reasons uh, somewhat grounded in our, our fields of specialization, too. But my, my story and the reason I ended up uh, even going in this direction in life, I mean, um, my mother remembers growing up when I was, uh, I think, eighth grade, I had a 0 0.3 in a report card. I was saved by one D minus. So, <laughs> kids, if I can do it, you can do it. <laughs> um, <clears throat> But I had, uh, I grew up uh, as a sixth generation Mormon, also with roots back to Scotland. And uh, my great, great, great grandfather was uh, Joseph Smith's, one of his bodyguards. And uh, I was down there with my mother and with my kids uh, when I started doing the early part of the research down at one of the cemeteries uh, in Salt Lake and found the headstone and the various wives that he had. And, uh, I'm a history buff too, so the whole thing was fascinating to me, but <clears throat> I grew up as a genealogical Mormon, right? Unlike our other two authors who converted later in life and attended BYU or were faculty at BYU, uh, we had left earlier on. Uh, but for me, it's because I, I did not reject the Mormon theology at the beginning. It's all that I knew. Uh, I believed in God. I, I went to church. I tried to follow the right ways. I declined baptism at age eight because I was serious about my faith. And the reason I say that is because I struggled with the idea that we believe that you should try, try your best and God will make up the rest versus what seems to be Mormonism coming out of the Book of Mormon, which is mission impossible, be perfect by this lifetime or else. And I knew that to be able to spend uh, eternal life, celestial glory with Heavenly Father, I had to have a clean slate. No unclean thing can enter, the Book of Mormon says. And I learned at baptism that if baptism washes away your sins, you've got a clean slate. At least this was the existential encounter that I'm having at the time. And, and I thought, well, what happens if I sin after I get baptized? Well, you've, you know, black marks on your, on your slate. And then I thought, okay, I know what I'll do. I'll beat the system. I'll wait till I'm 88 years old on my deathbed, and then I'll get baptized. But I freaked myself out, uh, thinking, what if I get hit by a semi-truck? Um, and so I finally got baptized at age nine. Um, wasn't too brave, I guess. But... You know, I, I encountered some hypocrisy, and you can't condemn a religion or, or a worldview because of bad apples. But my experience here in Salt Lake, uh, growing up, you know, in a single home, and my mom smoked, and you know what that means, right? Um, I'm sure a good portion of you here come from uh, an LDS background. And, and I just felt like, you know, I was kind of ostracized and... So I went to find those people who would love me, and it was those uh, different kinds of people who read about the green herbs <laughs> uh, early on. So I, I went into the adolescent direction that I shouldn't have. I never stopped believing in the, in the God that I'd been raised with. It's all I knew, but I thought, you know what? I don't need this community, and I was kind of frustrated, and I, I fell into the bad crowd. Um, but I, I didn't grow up with a father, and I, I believed that Heavenly Father was my father. And so there was still that 
presence there, even though I was kind of a rebellious child. But I had uh, a friend invite me later in my teenage years to go to this, uh, to go to California for the summer. I'd only seen the Great Salt Lake and you know what that's like. Uh, but I could go to California and spend the time at the beaches. But his dad says, no, it's on one condition. You go to this Christian camp for a week. Both of you go there. I'll pay for it. You spend this, the beaches, you know, Santa Cruz Beach for the whole summer. So I thought, okay, that sounds good. And I got there, and the preacher spoke on hell. And I tell people, that was it. It scared the hell out of me and heaven into me. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I really, you know, growing up in Utah, growing up with the idea of hell, it wasn't scary. Do, does anyone really go there? Uh, it's used for illustrative purposes. It's not really talked about. There's no, there's no uh, urgency to repent because God's still a loving Heavenly Father. I'm a basically good person, well, gooder than the other guy, right? And I'll, I'll make it. Uh, not a big deal. But when I, I knew I was going through some stuff in my life, in my life at that time, I knew I was a sinner. And when I got confronted with the law of God, the grace of God made sense in a way that it never had before. Grace became utterly graceful. And that's what the Apostle Paul talks about is uh, the law brings about the knowledge of sin, uh, its purpose is not to justify, but to terrify, and I was quite terrified. And uh, I saw the gospel clearly and uh, what Jesus did for me, and that was the first time I ever encountered that. And so I was, you know, snot-nosed kid in tears, and my world was rocked, and uh, I had this family invite me to stay there, you know, my junior year of high school. So I, you know, came back to Utah for the summer, packed my bags, got permission or whatever, went back to California, got discipled that year. Uh, the youth pastor that was there, uh, you know, poured into me and came back my senior year for high school. And that's when things started to really get uh, complicated uh, with extended family and friends and the culture, because now I would made a choice to become uh, not just to go off and do the, you know, the naughty stuff that I shouldn't be doing, but to explicitly reject Mormonism for a new religion, which wasn't new, it is the historical one, but uh, I was challenged by the idea that maybe, just maybe, on one interpretation anyway, you could be a son of perdition, and that's, that's pretty bad. Do you want to reread the Book of Mormon again? Yeah, I think I'll try that. So I went back through and reread the Book of Mormon, this time for the sake of truth rather than tradition, and found it uh, severely wanting, ran into some other material along the way. Um, Sandra Tanner's here tonight and saw some of her, her material, and and just making comparisons, and I, I started to uh, question, you know, Mormonism seriously. And I said, I'm glad I left. I, I'm done with this. I'm going to take my name off the rosters, and um, I'm going to move forward with this relationship with Christ. But then I started to think, how do I know that uh, this newfound faith grounded on the Bible that we believe as far as it's translated correctly is stable? How do I know it's reliable? How do I know God even exists? And if so, which God? Ah! And so I got pushed into this trajectory of philosophy and comparative religions and uh, became an insatiable pursuit in my life. Uh, little by little, I got excited about the evidence for Christianity and um, God built in me a desire for evangelism. And so I used to be, you know, as a young Christian, not knowing, you know, well, I just put it this way. I saw John the Baptist getting crazy in, on people in the New Testament. I thought we were all supposed to get crazy on people. So I used to get carried out of the Salt Lake Temple by security physically. And I was like, ah, martyrdom, right? Uh, I've, I've been domesticated a bit more today. But, you know, my heart was for evangelism after that. And I saw hell as a reality and people going there and what Jesus did as the way the path away from that. And so that became the passion of my life is evangelism. And I started to see the universities as strategic. One thing led to another. I went through uh, Bible colleges, became a pastor for a while, ended up going, turning into philosophy after uh, being in pastoral ministry for a while um, and found some serious hostilities along the way. And that uh, got me even more fired up to go into ministry going after professors. And so I joined Campus Crusade for Christ and started working on a PhD a second time since the first time evidently did not work. Uh, finished that. This opportunity opened up a couple of years ago with Rashio Christie, 
whose mission is to equip students and faculty with historical, philosophical, and scientific reasons for following Jesus, and that's where we're at today. So I, I can think of uh, nothing more exciting to be doing what I'm doing. And this was just part of my contribution to my past, my experiences that I could speak from uh, academically and also existentially in my heart and experience. So I want to I follow up with a couple of quick questions. And, and this is a different one for you, Vince, because your chapter surprised me in this way. You're, you have a degree in physics. You're a research scientist. I was expecting it to be very, very scientific. You, you my friend, are an existentialist to a degree. <laughs> and you got the other side of the brain working. And when I, when I read that, I wanted to follow up and just kind of find out from you, you know, what, what Mormonism has a, a great sociological appeal. It also has a great existential and experiential component. And I'm going to ask you a question about that in a moment. But what have you found fulfilling, in particular, in Christianity that maybe has been uniquely fulfilling existentially? So... <clears throat> Uh, yeah, it, it's funny. When I, when I shop, I don't use my reason to shop. It's usually I'll kind of walk through a guitar store and then I'll just fall in love with a guitar and buy it. But, and in some sense, the same way is, it's true with Christianity. It had to make sense to me. I had to get through all the questions. And I still work hard to answer my questions about the Bible, about science, about whatever. But the message that I can look around and see that humans are screwed up. My life is screwed up. We, you know, human history is filled with war and terror and, and bad decisions. The Christianity addresses that directly. Basically, it's God has created us to be good, to, to bring beauty into the world, and we have screwed up monstrously. But God, in a second message, sends his son as a gift to die in our place and offer us forgiveness so that we can get back into the game of pursuing goodness and adding beauty to the world. But even more, he gives us his spirit that we can participate with God in bringing goodness into the world. It isn't just that we're forgiven and so now we can be good. It is God himself gives us his spirit that we can participate with him to bring goodness into the world. And in some sense, it, it just answers the biggest existential question of my life is, why am I such a terrible person? And, and how am I going to solve that? Well, God, through Christ Jesus, is that solution. So it is very experiential. It yeah. Is. Well, I, I think that's a huge part. So I, I want to kind of bounce off that to a question to you that really is a focus of your chapter. And, you mentioned Horatio Christie. State the purpose one more time of your ministry. How did you state it? So the mission is a global movement that equips faculty and students with historical, philosophical, and scientific reasons for following Jesus. Okay, so those of us who are Christians here have been a Christian for any time in this valley. Probably you've dialogued with Latter-day Saints. You've gotten them in the corner. You've given them the history, the science, the theology, or all that's left is just to drop a hardcover study Bible on their head and they're going to come to Jesus. <laughs> and they say, wait a minute, you don't understand. I have a testimony. I know that I know that I know that I know. And if you knew like I knew, then you'd know. But you don't know. How do we deal with that? <laughs> it's just a small question. Yeah, as Robert Millett the former dean of religious studies at BYU has said, authority is everything in Mormonism. And for Mormons, you've got the prophets, the living prophet taking precedence. You've got the scriptures, standard works. For the average Mormon, the real authority at the end of the day is probably the testimony. 
uh, as Dahl and Oaks, the apostles, coined it a burning in the bosom. And sometimes, you know, you just get the hand, never mind with, with, with facts, I've got a feeling. And you just think, well, how can, I, how can I beat that? Let's just go get pizza. At least that's mutually edifying, right? <laughs> it's a conversation stopper. Um, but I think the Christians sometimes um, don't take the testimony seriously. Testimony is a valid form of knowledge. Uh, there's good philosophical grounds for it. There's good biblical grounds for it. Uh, most of what you learn, you learn by the testimony of someone else, your parents, your teachers, whoever. Um, but there's this idea of a testimony from the divine to me. How does one mind communicate with another? And in my chapter, I pulled from part of my dissertation looking at current uh, neuro and so social science on mind reading or joint attention um, and how, how we can come to know God, how God reveals himself to us. And this is, this is the end game. This is what it's all about. Jesus says in John 17, 3, here then is eternal life to know God. So there's got to be something there about the knowledge of God. And the Mormon has this spiritualized theory of knowledge uh, that is very prominent uh, and prevalent throughout their whole system. But Christians have this too. We have a testimony. Our testimony doesn't sound cookie cut like the Mormon testimony. It's not the trained or I may say canned testimony given at testimony meetings and so forth. Um, but we have a testimony and we should be able to parse the use and misuse properly of testimony, not only in apologetics and defending the faith or, or polemics kind of um, creating doubt in someone else to make room for a better reasonable faith, but uh, I want to have a testimony. I want to have a witness of the Spirit. I want to know God. I don't want to just read about God. And I don't want to just look out in nature, even though that affects me uh, too, like, like, like Dr. Eccles. Uh, Francis Bacon, the father of modern science, says there, there are the two books of God, uh, the book of Scripture and the book of nature, God's uh, word and God's work, and the two cannot contradict. And so it, it's beautiful to see that all truth is God's truth in this way. But I want more than just to look out in nature and be in awe as the effect and contemplate the cause. I want more than just to read about and come to believe that God is present in the world. I want to know God's presence. And scripture talks a lot about testimony. And so how do we handle it? Uh, I begin by thanking the Mormon for you know, going out on a limb and sharing something from their heart. And I, I want to build a bridge rather than a wall in the conversation. And then I share my testimony because that's powerful language to them. This is Mormonese, right? We need to be able to share our testimony. And our testimony is going to be not... I know this book is true. I know this church is true. I know the founding prophet is true. I bear you my testimony and a few other things. It is God revolutionized my life in Christ. He did it when I was 16 and he's doing it again this week and here's what's happening. That's powerful. That communicates. That's a powerful apologetic to a Mormon. But... In my view, and I, I mentioned this in, in part of my chapter, um, I think in our, in our witness to Mormons, we try to stay on the essentials, right? Uh, who is God? How does man get to heaven? Both of which find their segue in, uh, in the personal work of Christ. But the testimony, it's not an essential doctrine, but it is a, an essential conversation obstacle or opportunity that we need to take seriously because it is for them the ultimate buck stopper. So I'll use something like, um, I might call it the police lineup illustration, right? Where um, I say, imagine I go out into the forest. Now, if you've got a Mormon background, you're thinking the Grove experience here, right? <laughs> All these different denominations vying for my allegiance. I go out in the forest and I come back and I say, I, I just saw God. 
Um, and he says, you ought to join, you ought to join me, or, or, or that, that I'm the one that's restored the truth and, and you need to start following me. Would you do that? Uh, probably not. But they get the sense of where you're coming from in this and then turn it and say, look, if, if I want nothing more than to spend eternity with Heavenly Father, and you're here telling me that you've got the pathway to that, you've got the gospel message, what if I told you I've been reading literature from what used to be called the RLDS version? After Joseph Smith died, his first wife Emma and, their, and his son took off a different direction, started a movement there. Or the fundamentalists uh, who are you know, polygamous sects and so forth in Utah. Or if you read the book Scattering of the Saints written by Mormon authors, over 400 different sects since Joseph Smith's death, but we'll just go with the big three. One by one, it's like this police lineup. I put them before me and I say, which church is true? Which one should I join? And one by one, they bear me their testimony. And they begin crying, each one of them, sincerely. And they say, you can know it too if you just pray this prayer. But yet they each contradict each other. What that shows, what that demonstrates, is that at best, only one can be true and the rest are contradictory. At worst, maybe they're all contraries and they're all false and I need to go elsewhere. What it does is it uh, subverts the overconfidence, and that's what it is, that one can have in a uh, subjective testimony as the sole criterion for truth, right? Because you want to say, look, are you saying that the um, community of Christ or the FLDS or these other sects, are you saying they're lying? Are you judging their heart? Oh, no, no I would never judge. No one wants to judge today because it says it in red lettering, right? Um, so they, they never will say they, they're judging them as liars. So what you're telling me then is that they're deceived because your version is true, right? Right. So what you're saying then is that a subjective testimony like this can be deceptive, right? Right. How do you know you're not the one being deceived? So what you're doing is you're trying to ask good Socratic questions using illustration. You're trying to get uh, to disabuse them of this overconfidence in a sole criterion for truth as the subject of testimony. You want to bear your testimony and then say, look, I believe in testimonial evidence. I believe that I've encountered God. God has changed my life. But one's subjective testimony must also line up with the objective testimony of scripture, of science, of ethics, of philosophy. And you can see where you can go from there. I could say more, but no, absolutely. I want to, I want to give you guys an opportunity to ask some questions. I'm going to ask one more while people hopefully think about the question they want to ask and you can come up to this mic. We'll spin it around here, grab it. and You can ask your question. Um, the question I wanted to ask you is uh, last night, Stephen Hawking died and the, uh, you have a whole chapter at the end devoted to atheism. And I often, in consulting with other church planters coming in, will coach them a little bit and consult with them. And I'll tell them, you're going to read on Mormonism, but if you're moving to Utah, you really need to read on atheism because that's really where the pendulum often swings. So in his 2010 CNN interview, Hawking famously said, the scientific account is complete. Theology is unnecessary. So we'll start with Dr. Eccles, our resident physicist, challenging. I'm assuming you disagree. <laughs> Go out on a limb, but I want to know why. Why do you think he's wrong? Uh, about 10 years ago, so I, I've been a Christian for, you know, I don't know, 45 years or something. Uh, about 10 years ago, I uh, basically had a second a crisis of faith, being, the first being my crisis in, uh, with Mormonism. But my second being a crisis within the Christian body. Uh, in part, it was uh, just difficulties in life that were pressing down on me, uh, depression coming with that, with those difficulties. Uh, part of it was a, a fairly significant uh, set of arguments within our church that uh, 
tended to focus on me for some reason. <laughs> and I, if you read my chapter, I basically describe how I descend and spiral, and I have to face, is God real? Is atheism more likely than theism, or Christianity in particular? And I, I kind of catalog, I did a lot of reading. I did uh, reading philosophy and theologians and lots of philosophy. And I catalog kind of a thought process of how I can't go there. I can't go to the abyss of atheism. And there, there isn't really evidence that I can point to. It isn't that, I mean, the Bible will still be true history, whether I believe God or not. I mean, the, Jesus did exist, and he was killed by Pilate on, on a cross. And, and you know, I'll, it's history. But is God real? It's still the question. And in some sense, you don't, as a physicist, you can't look out and say, physics is going to demonstrate that God exists. But when I get down to the bottom of the ladder and look in the abyss of no God, it is, it's empty. This universe cries out to me that there is beauty, that there is a real moral good, and even more significantly to me, there is real evil. And if evil is real, if killing of six million Jews in the last century and uh, rape and pedophilia and all these things, if that is not real evil, then what a terrible universe. It is evil itself that convinces me that there must be good. Mm -hmm. And that good is crying out to us. And that good is the solution for the evil that's in the universe. And that's the basis that I return to my faith in Christ. I, I hope for, I trust that God is good and that he calls me to good and that he will get me to an end that is good. And I say that for all of the body of Christ, because he saves a people to himself. So uh, that is my basis. Corey, any additional thoughts on that? Stephen Hawking's comment. And, and if you've got a question, come on up to the mic while Corey's answering, and you'll be the first one to ask. Yeah, we've got a specific so here's the statement. The statement was, oh, the scientific account is complete. Theology is unnecessary. God is unnecessary as a, an assumption for the universe. Yeah, I think, um, uh, first of all, Neil deGrasse Tyson asked Stephen Hawking, so what came before the Big Bang? And Hawking said, nothing. <laughs> nothing, nothing. Uh, Aristotle said, nothing is that which rocks dream about. <laughs> <laughs> the bang, the singularity has to have an explanation. And uh, as Aristotle said, that we are by nature, um, uh, we desire to know by nature. We want explanation. And this universe requires an explanation that goes, that transcends science. Uh, science, as we take it today, uh, makes certain, it relies on certain philosophical assumptions Number one, that my sense perceptions are even reliable. Uh, I'm colorblind, for example. I didn't know it until I got ready to go off to the army. How do you know your sense perceptions are reliable? How do you know you're even seeing me right now? Uh, how do you know you're not in a dream? You've had those real dreams, right, where you wake up and you're like, was that, was that real? Am I still in the dream? How do you know you're not in a dream? How do you know your sense perceptions are reliable? 
the only way you can answer that is a track record argument because they were reliable before, but that begs the questions. It makes certain philosophical assumptions. The reliability of our sense perceptions makes sense on theism, where God created us to be able to steward the world. Uh, not so much on atheism. Um, science makes assumptions about uh, rationality, the laws of logic on which it relies. Nothing in science can give me absolute certainty. Nothing. Nothing in physics. At best, I can get high, high levels of probability, but nothing of certainty. But I can have certainty in the laws of logic. In fact, they're inescapable. Uh, you can't deny the laws of logic without assuming them in your denial. And yet, what does the not law of non-contradiction taste like? What does it smell like? What does it sound like? Or what texture is it? Science can't tell you. And yet, science can't get off the tarmac without the laws of logic. I can know things for certainty in logic, in mathematics. Vince deals with quite regularly in physics. But it's relying on math and in introspective philosophy. Um, that this universe is real, that I can know it. Um, so many things that it, it just relies on. Stephen Hawking also said that philosophy is dead. He made a philosophical statement about philosophy. <laughs> um, but, you know, behind every PhD is a doctorate of philosophy, a doctorate of philosophy and physics a doctorate of philosophy in philosophy, a doctorate of philosophy in education, in history, in biology, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there is a philosophy or a theology about everything. Science isn't operating in a vacuum. Some people have an atheological view of science, some a theological view of science. It does not operate in a vacuum. And so I would just say it's absurd to make such a statement. <laughs>